The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Podcast Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Coco, where we will discuss the deeper layers and meaning, not of the hot beverage, but of the Disney Pixar movie based on the Mexican cultural traditions of the Day of the Dead, uh, Dia de Muertos. And uh, joining me today on the panel are Angela Silana. Hello, Angela. Hey, Dom. Hey, other person that we're going to be talking about soon. <laughs> And of course, that other person is Deborah Shaven. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome to you both, uh, and uh, I'm so glad you're joining me uh, to talk about this movie. Um, in case you're uh, just finding this in your feed, this is the Disney Pixar movie that came out in October t 2017. Animated movie uh, about a, a Mexican family and the traditions and and ad an adventure surrounding. The, uh, the, tr the traditional holiday, Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Um, and just as a straight up front forewarning, uh, we're going we're gonna to spoil the movie. We're going to talk about everything in the movie. So if you haven't actually seen the movie a year, almost a year later, um, and you don't want to be spoiled, pause, go get it off of iTunes or whatever, come back, and then <laughs> uh, rejoin us. Because I think you're going to enjoy this. I I'm looking forward to this. This is one of those ones where I want to... Um, to hear what other people really have to say about this, because I think we're going to get some interesting discussion um, of, around it. So, and I'm I'm looking forward to what these two ladies have to say about Coco. So, the basic story is that there's a a little town in Mexico called Santa Cecilia, which um, first little bit, uh, Saint Cecilia is the patron saint of music, uh, the yeah. Catholic patron saint of music. So, Santa Cecilia, Mexico, um, where this family. Um, of shoemakers has rejected music in all its forms. They won't listen to it. They won't play it. They don't because um, this this young child Miguel, his great grandfather, right? I'm trying to remember the mm -hmm. great great grandfather yes. or mm -hmm. um, great great ha, yeah great great grandfather ha, uh, had abandoned the family for music, and uh, and so music was forbidden. But the boy loves music and idolizes. This uh, um, famous Mexican uh, musician and actor, Ernesto de la Cruz, Ernest of the Cross, if you want to translate that as well, uh, <laughs> which doesn't sound nearly as good uh, as Ernesto de la Cruz. <laughs> and he um, and through some uh, events, uh, it's the Day of the Dead in, in Mexico and, and, and Miguel ends up crossing over into the, the, the land of the dead. And has his adventures where he has to save this guy, Hector. He's trying to meet his great, great grandfather, so on and so forth. And uh, we'll, we'll get into the whole thing. But, yep. Can I just, there is one thing that I think also, um, and when we talk about the Pixar storylines, um, which is one of the, we, we were talking um, a little pr prior to this about Pixar uses the hero's journey. And yes. if you've ever, ever want to know how Pixar, Pixar puts the story together, Google like 17 story steps for Pixar and it'll tell you. And there's, there's always like the, who am I? So Miguel is always like, Oh, I am a musician. His family's like, no, no, you're not. You're not going to be. Well, um, part of his Coco, um, the, um, going to the land of, um, the afterlife or wherever they're going to call it is, he wants to come back, but only if he can come back who he is uh, as a musician. And, um, and that becomes a big plot point too. He's like, I'm not just going to come back and be a shoemaker. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. His identity is so, uh, is, is central to the story. The idea of who am I? Um, mm -hmm. And, and that tension between who I believe I, I'm called to be. So in a sense, he has a calling. Right versus what my family expects me to be. And because it's in a particular cultural context, the the the, the expectations of family are, are are different than, say, 
or c- certain other cultures, whether it, I don't know, uh, a, a British culture. I don't know what family expectations are in <laughs> British culture. Maybe uh, if I watched Downton Abbey, maybe I would re- realize it's the same thing. But, yeah. uh, but, but that he, this family has certain expectations of him that he, that he doesn't want to follow, which is, I mean, let's be honest, this is a very common theme in, in movies and storytelling. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, but it's, it's, a, we're, they're trying a different spin on it here, of course. Yes. Um, so let, let's just kind of start at the basic uh, when we're, we're trying to like tease out the meaning, because all of this revolves around the Dia de Muertos, the day that it, what is the day of the dead? I mean, uh, if, if I could maybe, um, can I, can I ask you that Angela, the day, what the day yeah. of the dead is from your perspective? But what is it for, yeah. for those of us who are not from the Mexican culture or Hispanic culture? Uh, yeah. And just to give some background, um, I have family with Mexican um, heritage, um, which means I have Mexican heritage. Um, and I live in San Antonio, Texas, um, the South, uh, especially Texas, South Texas, um, also all the way to New Mexico, California. Dia de los Muertos is very um, prominent in the culture here in San Antonio. Um, we celebrate also, so it's uh, November 1st and 2nd, which coincides with the Catholic holiday feast days of uh, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Um, so from my perspective, yes, I've participated in Dia de los Muertos. Um, in my family, we have ofrendas to... Um, family members that have passed away. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful tradition that, that I grew up with. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people have, I guess, expressed that I thought was really interesting after seeing Coco, even if they didn't see the movie, but just seeing it advertised was, um, wow, this is a kid's movie, but there's all these skeletons and skulls and that's really scary. Right. Um, so coming from the Mexican background, um, just to preface the, the ex- explanation of the holiday, um, the Mexican, ancient Mexican history, um, the people, the Mayan people and the Aztec people have um, venerated their deceased for, you know, thousands of years. And so the deceased members of the family, of the neighborhood, of the community were always, um, you know, thought of as active members of your life still. Um, so it, it has some similarities to like the Catholic understanding of the communion of saints um, that people who have passed on, you know, do have some influence or some connection to us who are living on this earth. Um, So for the Mexican people to think about death is really um, not a scary thing. It's not um, this like, ooh, creepy, like Halloween boo, you know, Uh, type of scary thing. Um, So a lot of people think of Dia de los Muertos as Mexican Halloween, and that's not what it is. When you see people dressed up with like skull um, masks, or they paint their faces to look like a skull, um, there's a lot of like candy skulls and different um, imagery there. Um, For the most part, that is um, just this idea that, you know, death is a gateway to another part of life um, and that uh, death doesn't, uh, it's just kind of like, um, I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's just a part of life. And uh, we celebrate the people that have lived, um, that have been a part of our lives. And um, yeah, so... So Dia de los Muertos in particular is um, what the what you get when you get Spanish missionaries coming in um, and incorporating the native ideas um, into the Catholic spirituality. And so you have this amalgamation of these different cultures. Um, And also, just to be clear, you know, when we say Mexican culture, that is 
a lot of different cultures. It's not just one culture. So like, you know, you talk about like even French culture, you know, there's all different peoples that created and became the French culture, right? So same thing with Mexico too. So you have a lot of different ideas about um, the afterlife, about, um, you know, spirituality, about family and our relationship to family. And then you get the Catholic um, European ideas also and traditions. Um, so that kind of added up to um, today what, you know, typically my family will do is um, we have um, like a picture of a loved one that we put um, somewhere in a special place in the home um, and we include like little, like maybe a little skull or a little like skeleton um, to kind of like, um, sometimes it's, it's a, a sort of a reference to who that person was. So if they were like a playful person, like maybe a skeleton doing something funny or um, a musician or something like that. And then you have maybe like something that reminds you of that person that's kind of something that they liked. Like, for example, my great grandmother, um, we she loved gardening and she loved birds. And so we put like a little um, statue of a bird, um, maybe like a plant or something like that. And it's just kind of a way to um, like have that tangible sort of feeling reminder of that person. Um in the movie Coco, you see like these kind of ghost like figures sort of taking like, I guess, the spiritual essence of like the food or the beverage or whatever. And yeah, there there may be some people who literally think that that happens. But in reality, like for me growing up, that was never part of how my family thought of it or how... Um, other people that I grew up with, with Mexican heritage, that they they didn't think of it that way. So I guess that's maybe one answer to one question that some people might have. Um, and then another part of it is for us, like as a very Catholic family, we pray for that person um, on those two days in particular. And we tell stories about that person and. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge, huge celebration. You see um, ofrendas, which is the name for that little gathering of objects with the picture. Um, you see those like all over the place, um, even in public places like here in San Antonio. If you go to like a, a Catholic college or maybe even a non-Catholic college, a public college, you'll see um you know, students and teachers and all kinds of, you know, different places, even like downtown restaurants have ofrendas, all kinds of places. And also churches will have ofrendas um, of loved ones. So one of the one of the questions that comes up with with the movie and its depiction of the of the days of the of the dead is that um, it sort of lacks uh, Catholic trappings. I mean, there's a little bit of Catholicism at this you see an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Someone will say, you know, call on Mary. There's crosses and gravestones, priests and nuns in, in the movies that you see in the in the and, but but not a whole lot of other Catholicism. Yeah, connected to. Well, the, um, Go ahead. No, I was going to say there was one where Grandma, the Grandma, yep. actually crosses herself a couple times during the movie. Yes, but right. that's it's very subtle. You would you would not notice it if you weren't paying attention. And some people say, well, that what they've, what Disney has done here is stripped uh, Catholicism out of the celebration and kind of made a secular version of it. But I wonder, and, and, I, and coming at this from, from the outside, I wonder if that portrays actually a certain lack of understanding of how cultures, not just Mexican culture, but even like European cultures, like so, especially Southern European, which is my background. Um, they didn't make such distinctions between the secular and the sacred. I mean, the faith was in everything and the secular was kind of in the faith and we didn't, we didn't go in and out of it. And it wasn't something, you know, like I'm, I'm doing my Catholic thing now and then I'm not doing the Catholic thing over here. <laughs> and, and, and so this maybe cause, cause I've heard some people from them with, from a Mexican background say, no, no, you don't understand. Like this, not really stripping Catholicism out of it. It's just, 
you know, this is what it is, even if you don't talk about the Catholic content, that it's just yeah. there. I mean, it would be nice if there were a Catholic priest in the movie or a, or a, a religious sister who helps guide young Miguel, you know, in, <laughs> on his path, whatever. I mean, sure, that would be nice, I suppose, but, but not it, strictly necessary. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if there were some Catholic saints, too, hanging around in the afterworld? <laughs> well, right. Well, I mean, in, in, in some ways, that might have been more problematic for some people because this after, uh, this this afterlife, this world, kind of feels like, maybe we can get into that, kind of feels mm -hmm. like purgatory, uh, that place right. in between. Because So in the movie, they talk about how um, the, 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 the setup for the whole movie is um, – that as long as the person is remembered, the family members remembered on the ofrenda, uh, they they live in this um, beautiful, amazing life after death world. Uh, this is, it, it, I mean, it's the visuals of it are amazing. I have to say, mm -hmm. they really went all out on that. Um, but as soon as the last person forgets them, or the last person who remembers them dies, uh, they ha they have the final death. Which it, is that actually a part of the the traditional understanding? No, um, this is something Disney not, came up I, with. I yeah, the way that I look at the movie is it's Pixar using Dia de los Muertos as like the vehicle to to tell a story that conveys family themes. Right. So um, it's not like a theological statement it's not like <laughs> yeah. um portraying like mexican theological ideas like it's just it's like a fantasy pixar movie that happens to use like kind of play with the idea of what happens after you die um and so yeah i mean for me like uh, and something that i told you guys like before this i was sort of like confused when I saw all these reviewers who were Christian reviewers talking about like, oh, well, this movie like doesn't really, it confuses people about the spirituality and, and theology and stuff. And I was kind of like, whoa, like I coming from that background, I didn't even get any like religious connections to it, which yeah, goes to show exactly what you were saying, Dom, that like the you know, even if you don't practice your Catholicism, like as a Mexican, you know, person of Mexican descent, it's so ingrained in the culture. Like you still cross yourself. You still have Our Lady of Guadalupe all over your house. You might even have a crucifix in your home. Like it's just part of the culture. So, right. yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea of, you know, crossing the border, you know, to in the, the land of the dead and going in and out of customs and stuff like that. I thought it was just cute. And it was um, it was kind of fun. I mean, you kind of need to when you have when you're dealing with people who have already died, you need to create some type of tension. It's like, well, like they, they're dead already. They, you, you can't put them in jeopardy. So they have to yeah. create jeopardy for them. Um, and, and in fact, Stephen Gray Donis, the he's the Catholic movie reviewer, uh, in his review of it, he he actually says there's a, a collection of short stories by this author, David Eagleman, in which uh, it's it's a he has a story called Metamorphosis where he describes a um, uh, an afterlife that's a, sort of a waiting room or airport-type lobby where the departed mill about socializing, but only so long as they're remembered among the living. And when the last memory of a dead person dies on Earth, the individual's name is called, and they depart through a door to what is said to be a better place, and he calls it the third death, first death being bodily death and the, then burial, which is actually something we hear in the movie is there's three deaths, the, the bodily death, burial, and then the final death, they call it, not the third death. Um, so in the, in the short story that it sounds like they kind of got this idea from, um, they, it, it's even more explicit, it feels more explicit like purgatory. I suppose I should explain purgatory for those who, if who might not know it, but purgatory in Catholic understanding is, um, <clears throat> there's two places you can go when you die. You can go to heaven or you can, you can end up in hell. Uh, in heaven, only that which is perfect can exist with God. Uh, and so no, no sin or attachment to sin. Uh, can be in heaven. And so purgatory is the place that we go. And I'll, I'll just read, I'll say where I'll probably go, <laughs> God willing, <laughs> if I, if I, if I don't die in the state of mortal sin, if I get, if I get to go to heaven, I'll, I'll probably end up in purgatory where, as the name suggests, 
any attachment, earthly attachment to sin is purged out of me until I get to heaven. Scott Hahn, who's a great Catholic uh, theologian, he was one of my professors in school. He described it as <clears throat> you go and you take the re a really hot shower. You ever take a really hot shower that burns and kind of hurts, uh, but it feels so good to get clean, you know, from this really hot shower. That's sort of what it is. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not exactly pleasant, but it's, but it's a place that's on the way to, to our final destination. And in some ways, that's what this feels like. I mean, uh, do, you, do you agree with, with me on that? Or uh, is it somewhere in the ballpark? Now that you mention it, I think I think you you have a good theory that I wouldn't have put together watching it on my own. Um, because I was a little confused about the final death, too, because seem, it seems so ominous in the movie. Yeah. It seems like oh, it's a, it's a bad thing to be forgotten, but maybe it's a maybe it's a good thing. Nobody seems to know. So, um, but I really do like your purgatory theory, um, which is also you know, um, without saying it, it's it's um, it's it's harder to uh, if you're gonna sell this movie worldwide, you can't just automatically say, hey, this is purgatory. We're gonna use all these Catholic <laughs> ideas, otherwise you're gonna lose. Right. a good portion of your audience. There's going to be so that Catholic it, Pixar movie. <laughs> right. And then, you know, they're not going to be able to show it in, you know, half of their market areas around the world. So, yeah, you know, one of the other things that kind of reminds me of is uh, another place that like a literary use of this sort of idea that is not Catholic explicitly is in uh, J.R.R. Tolkien in the Silmarillion, um, he talks about the fate of man. So there's, you know, you have the the, the dwarves, the elves, and man, and uh, the elves are immortal. And if they die on this earth, they kind of go to um, live in this in Valinor, which is not really separate from the earth. It's still part of the world. Uh, the dwarves are likewise. It doesn't bear getting into. But the fate of man is, is if he dies, he goes um, through the outer wall, where even the Valar, who are the 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 great archangels, if you want to use a Christian description of the of the world of Middle Earth, even they don't know what lies beyond that. But they call it the gift of man, um, and and so Tolkien, in that sense, is also sort of envisioning this idea of you know there being like the halls of Mando, so where the where the uh, the elves tarry, the elves who die uh, spend the time you know their time until the the final end of the of the world. Um, but but men get, go beyond that through the outer edges of the world, and I and I feel like that's kind of what we do. What what Coco is kind of describing is a is a is a as a world where uh, there's a a place that we know, and there's a place beyond. Although I have to, kind of, someone will bring up as an exception when Chicharron, the this figure that Miguel encounters, who does have this final death, when he disappears, nobody's thinking, oh, he's going on to his final rest. It's really presented as a final like it's like the worst thing that could happen right yeah a dematerialization he doesn't exist anymore in any way mm -hmm. yeah I, yeah well um, can i bring up a, a flaw in your <laughs> and this yes. is i just it just occurs to me yes. and not a flaw just a conundrum but you could almost answer it with a catholic answer which is why is ernesto de la cruz in purgatory considering he would have died in mortal sin because he committed murder and he doesn't feel right. a bit sorry for it Right. Um, but you could always say, oh, it was the mercy of God. He's still being, you know, perfected, you know, but he's it's interesting when you bring up that theory. It's like, well, why is Ernesto there if this is the case? Right. Well, and, and in fact, the, the 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 other problem with the, the purgatory theory is um, in, in some ways for, for Catholics, remembering people in purgatory helps them move beyond purgatory, whereas this is the opposite. It keeps them in this place. Which is not really pur pur purgatorial. It's more, uh, you know, it's more like like a, a second phase of life in a sense. So it's, it doesn't fit neatly, but it's it sort of has this idea of a way station. To right. me, to me, it was um, a beautiful allegory for how I grew up in my Mexican part of my family, as um, remember how important it is to remember those who have gone on before us mm -hmm. um, and just the immense uh, respect and love, uh, you know, not that, not that there isn't that in other cultures, but just 
from my, you know, the, the side of my family that is Mexican, um, it's like on another level, <laughs> like uh, intense, yeah. important. It, it, if those of us who aren't from Me uh, with Mexican culture, we don't, I don't think, like, even like, as a Sicilian, you, rem you know, oh, you're, you honor your grandmother and you, those, but no, I, I recognize it is not even close to being the same sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, but, and, and maybe, maybe if for folks who kind of live um, in Texas or places where there are a lot of folks from Mexico, it, it's a little more familiar. But for those, for, again, for those of us who don't, I live in Massachusetts, which is about as far removed from, uh, Mexican culture, sadly, as we can get, uh, um, we're just getting <laughs> good Mexican food here. So, it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's it, it's it's it, it you, it's different uh, than than even yeah. that sort of a respect for those who come before. Um, one of the things I kind of I wanted to bring up just that it's, this is kind of a specific question. What is it about marigolds? Is that something that's that is part of the c culture, or is that something? Th okay. So that's yeah, something yeah. that's part of the, the, the traditions. Yeah. So um, those are specific marigolds that are native to Mexico. They're called cempasuchil. And that is, um, I think, an Aztec word that means um, 20 flower because it has a lot of petals in it. And it's also very, very fragrant. Fragrant. Um, and so the idea is that the either the fragrance or the bright gold color, like, will help guide lost souls to their family members. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's kind of part of the the, okay. the Aztec idea. OK, because it's a it's a key element in this uh, in in the story, in this bridge between worlds and that the the, mar the the I mean, the marigold petals uh, are, are very important. And I, I, I love the the visual of it. It's so it's a beautiful, colorful uh, way of conveying that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we wanted to talk about was uh, just the form of the story. And Deborah, I think you brought this up, was about the, this is a classic in, in Pixar, the classic hero's journey. Um, we see the same thing in, in very like in very many forms throughout the, the Pixar movies, especially like I was saying that this is like um, a, a Mexican version of Ratatouille in, in one sense where we have a, 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 a non-Anglophone setting where a young protagonist with a creative passion that his family doesn't understand and wouldn't approve of. Though of course the family comes around in the end, it, they, he pursues it in secret, and then they f he finds instruction and inspiration in a deceased celebrity with an inspirational motto, an artist and entertainer who's perhaps his country's greatest icon of his chosen field. In and so like in both films, the plot is set in motion when a misstep in the protagonist's pursuit of his secret passion unexpectedly triggers a fateful crisis, separating him from his family and casting him into unfriendly surroundings. I mean. I'm I'm reading this verbatim <laughs> from from Stephen Gray Donis. I'm totally ripping him off on this, but but that's it's. I mean, you could kind of say, oh, they totally ripped themselves off. But in another way, they've. I mean, you could say Moana is a version of this. You could say other yes. other movies, even Up, Up, sort Car of Cars. <laughs> you could say Cars <laughs> is a version of this. I mean, but and so is it so much that they're ripping themselves off, or is that Pixar's really feels like uh, your know, Toy Story? all of these movies are really telling the, a classic story, which is the hero's journey. I mean, the hero's journey may be the most basic of all human stories that we, that goes back to, you know, the, the Odyssey and even beyond that, you know, before uh, Homer in oral tradition. Um, so Deborah, well, you had, I think you had something you wanted to say about that, right? Well, it's more actually, if it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And, you know, right now Pixar has a formula that is, you know, working for, you know, bringing in Oscar nominations and, and, um, you know, reaching not only their target mar market, which is children, but also adults that are enjoying this film too. Um, as a, a, a kind of an ant, um, uh, a side note, I was um, fishing through Facebook the other day and a, a friend of mine here in um, Nebraska, she's a playwright and she has children who are, you know, go to a lot of play practices with her and, and um, know their theater. And they went to a, a recent children's mu uh, movie that's in the theaters right now. And I don't even remember which one, but they just, this eight year old's like, it was very forgettable, except their major plot point came 15 minutes before the film ended, and he didn't understand why. <laughs> so maybe this whole idea that um, 
they have this formula that works for them and they're not going to vary from it because then it leads to like a whole hum film, you know, and, and they can, and, and, and I think it's, um, this retelling is there's a mil, you know, nothing new under the sun. So just the retelling of these, this basic, um, plot line, um, in new and various ways, it just breathes new life into it that you don't even really notice unless you're like watching it multiple times, just like we are and saying, Hey, that looks vaguely familiar. But, um, you know, uh, what name me an original movie that's, um, that doesn't use, you know, this kind of plot line and, well, you know, and Star Wars an and yeah, I mean, Star then... Wars uses, no, no, Star Wars uses Hero's Journey. Have you yes. ever read that? It, it, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it is, it is Hero's Journey. I mean, Luke is, you know, his uncle wants him to stay on the farm and the, I mean, it's the whole thing. He's, mm-hmm. he feels a calling to a greater thing and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and he's taken away by circumstances. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. And perhaps, by having you know um, a French version of this and a Mexican version of this and a Polynesian version of this and and all these different, what it's saying is not that it's ripping it off, but what it's saying is that it's a universal story, that mm-hmm. right. that that it's something that it's 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 just deeply human that we all can relate to this story, this journey, this this need, you know, this this feeling that we're called to greater things and and right. it. To, I did it maybe our mission as, as a Catholic, right. You know, not, you know, to Catholic by the, the whole Pixar thing, but you know, everybody has a mission in life and what's yours and what are you being called and what do you have to overcome to pursue that mission? Right. So, you know, it, it, it does change. It varies person to person what they have to overcome. And, and Pixar does a great um, job of putting each of these characters, even Wally in like a, you know, this desolate place and he has to overcome his place to, you know, to save the world. So, and that was his mission. Right. But, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think Pixar is going to change their movie formula because it just, it's just heads over, you know, tails better than all the other movie companies out there. <laughs> right. And it's just making them, <laughs> it's working, you know, people are aligning. <laughs> yeah. It's working for them. So why, why change it? Yeah. Um, I don't see yeah. how you could change it. Like, how would you, you know, how could you change that original formula so that it's not some, so it's completely something different? Well, I mean, like you said, the, the other people are making different kinds of uh, movies aimed at kids from an animated perspective that aren't as good because they don't they don't connect on such a deep level as this does. Um, and, and, you know, when, when you mentioned that, you know, that from from a Catholic perspective, I mean, what is our we're called we have a calling. We're all we, you know everyone should be should feel like we're being called to something greater and from a catholic perspective it's to holiness and to sainthood and to that life of, of the afterlife um and that we have this passion and one of the things that happens in movies is, in these movies is we're always told like if you have a passion follow it and you know don't ever give up your dreams and that's not always Actually, the best advice for young people. <laughs> can I can I just point out something I found? Um, you know, okay, so um, Ernesto's catchphrase was "seize your moment," right? Yes. And every time, and this is where um, Miguel. Every somebody pointed this out in, a, in a, one of those you know Uber fan chat room things. Every time he went to use that um, advice to seize his moment, it all went wrong for him. Right. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Every time he so, followed Ernesto's advice, uh, especially right, and and tried to seize his moment, it, something happened to him. So right. can so I tell you wrong. something really cool that I picked up on watching the Spanish version of this movie? Oh yes, please. Okay, so at the beginning, when Miguel is, um, he has his his parents uh, gave him the apron, and they're like, "You're going to be a shoemaker. This is a great idea." And and um, something that his dad says to him is. Um, because you are a Rivera and a Rivera is, and Miguel responds, a shoemaker, right? So that's the English version. Yeah. Well, in the Spanish version, um, his dad says the same thing. And Miguel responds, un zapatero hasta los huesos, which means a shoemaker to the bone, or you could translate it as until the bone. 
So not only does that go with the skeleton idea to right. where when once he's turning into a skeleton, he's starting to like even more so, uh, you know, renounce his family name that at the point where he's in the land of the dead and he um, enters the talent show, he enters a talent show as under the name De La Crucito, which means the little De La Cruz, right? right. So and then after um, the you know, he, he, he has a great show and the lady comes up, up, up onto the stage and she says, oh, I have this announcement. There's a family that's looking for a live boy, blah, blah, blah. And Miguel runs away. Well, he even like, he tells Dante, the, you know, his kind of spirit guide, like, get out, you know, I don't need you anymore. I don't need anybody. And as he's walking away, you see in the background, there's this, there's this little shop that he passes called Huesos International which means Bones International. So literally this moment in the movie where he has completely renounced his name, his family, everything, he has be he has been a Rivera until the Bones. Until the Bones International. It's wow. pretty amazing. Oh, Very literal. Wow. Yeah. yeah it, and and that's the idea is like his as his as the time goes goes by, he's become and he spends more time in this world. Um and he has to be gone by by the sunrise. Um, he's turning into one of the the skeleton figures of the, of the he's dying essentially. Uh, they don't come out and say it because it's a kids movie, but he's dying. Um, so he's really turning to bones, and and so like you say, he has been a shoemaker until he becomes the bones. But after that, he's no longer he's not going to be the sh a shoemaker. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. I, see, I kind of you know. <laughs> uh, I kind of wish there was like what you know that was actually in the English version. I'm kind of sad that it wasn't in there. Yeah. Um, the uh, so I was going to say on that. Um, well, anyway, uh, we, we can move we can move on fr from that uh, unless you uh, you remember you know or something comes back. Uh, remember me the some of the, some of that. But uh, speaking of remember me, the music in in this movie, I yes. love the music. It's a great soundtrack. Yes. Uh, Deborah, I know you were listening to the soundtrack before we started. I was listening to the soundtrack uh, to kind of get into the mood. Um, I use the, I don't know if you go to genius.com, the genius lyrics. Um, it's oh, really, yeah. I really like that. I, I discovered that with the Hamilton soundtrack, which could be a whole nother podcast, but the Hamilton soundtrack, <laughs> um, they, you know, they, they, it's, um, how do you, they, it's annotated. The lyrics are often annotated. And oh. so it, someone will, and it's, it's a, uh, uh, done like Wikipedia, which the the crowd the the crowdsourced. Uh, my brain's not working <laughs> fully like that, yeah. but uh, but it's crowdsourced, and so they they get the translation. For those of us who don't speak Spanish, I I, I can kind of figure things out because of other languages I speak. But um, but the translations and some of the subtleties of the translation, which is interesting, come out in that. But also some of the background of of some of the songs. Um, but uh, but the music itself is beautiful. Uh, uh, and there's two soundtracks. There's the there's an English soundtrack, and then there's the the, the Spanish language soundtrack, and then the um, the score, the the non singing part of the movie music is done by Michael Giacchino, who's like my second favorite uh, co uh, music uh, composer, uh, you know, soundtrack composer after um, yeah. of course John Williams. Is, uh, it's got to be my favorite, but <laughs> but you know, Michael Giacchino, I, I love his stuff. He's done The Incredibles. He's done Star Trek. So he, he's really good. Um, but remember me won an Academy Award, the Oscar for mm, Best see. Original Song. Um, and it's such a beautiful song that when you first hear it, it's Ernesto singing it, and it's just, just his big hit, you know? And you think it's and it's sort of a symbolic of Ernesto. Nobody will forget Ernesto de la Cruz forever because he's the greatest singer ever. There are statues mm. and 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 they play his his, his uh, movies all the time, so he'll never be forgotten and never suffer the final death. Um, but then you realize through it that it's actually uh, Hector who wrote the the um, uh, the, the, the song lullaby. the lullaby for his daughter to remember mm -hmm. him. When I'm on the road, I'm a musician, you know, working musician, and when I'm on the road, you remember me, uh, your father, because I'll be back. And okay, so. The first time they play it, they do it in the flashback where he's singing to his daughter. Okay, I had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they might have got a little dusty in here. You know what I mean? I, it's like, <laughs> yeah. as, a, as a father of little girls, I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> um, and then at the end, when Miguel sings it to 
Coco, his abuelita, uh, you know, that because she's she's um, she's she's ancient. <laughs> she's not just elderly. <laughs> she's ancient and she's she's barely present. I mean, she's suffering apparently dementia of some sort and forgetting mm -hmm. her father. And he sings the song to her that she remembers. I mean, what a powerful moment. And it and it and it all hit me. Why this movie is called Coco? It's not Hector. <laughs> yeah. It's not Miguel. <laughs> it's about this woman who's not in the movie except for a few minutes at the beginning and the end. Uh, so I mean, <laughs> yeah. so what do you? So I've been talking about this. What do you like? You know, what what do you what what about this strikes you? Um, the the song or just about Coco herself and her relationship to her father. Well, uh, did you know that that song "Remember Me" is mm -hmm. played in seventeen different styles throughout the movie? Seventeen. You, you hear wow. about seventeen different styles because if you remember before the talent show when he's like, "What song are you sing?" and like, "Oh, I think oh, Remember yeah. Me," and then they go through all of these like people backstage <laughs> singing it. And, yes, you know, even dogs. Because everybody know? sings <laughs> "Remember Me" because it's the signature song. So "Remember Me" was performed seventeen different ways in that movie. Oh wow! So cool. each way you hear it, it's going to be different in that movie. So just a little trivia, a little it, Disney trivia. There in one you. sense, it's because everyone in that in the afterlife wants to be remembered. I mean, so mm, it, it, yeah. no wonder why it would connect with them, for instance. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, for me personally, oh, my gosh, I was crying through this whole movie, <laughs> even from the very first um, scene, <laughs> just because it resonated with my culture. But um, for me, my dad plays guitar. And so I oh. grew up with my dad playing guitar to me. And so, oh, my gosh, like <laughs> that was yeah. intensely emotional for me. But um, one of the cool things that I realized, you know, I was like, oh, Coco, Coco. Um, that name actually is short for Socorro, which is mm -hmm. a woman's name. And um, it's part of the title Our Lady of Perpetual Help um, oh. in in English, uh, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Um, and so that that name Socorro, it's it's not it's not rare, um, but sometimes people go by usually like a, a nickname like Coco or Suki or something like that. So, um, it's, it's kind of neat when you think about like the, the history of that particular image of Mary, the Virgin Mary, um, our lady of perpetual help that she is this mother who like the tradition that I've heard is that, um, there's these two angels that are kind of over, the, uh, she's holding Jesus, baby Jesus. And over his shoulders are two angels that are carrying like the, um, the instruments of his crucifixion. Mm. And so it's like a mother who is comforting her, her child, um, in this kind of scary time. So um, when you kind of combine all those things, it's, wow. it's neat how the, the imagery really becomes a little bit more rich. I mean, it really, yeah. and how does, I mean, that, that kind of relates to this story, you know, that, that, that she is the, she's the mother of this family in a sense, you know, of, of the, that's left on earth who, yeah. who, you know, is the help for the family that's going to be on or for her father, you know, uh, they appeal to her, they call to her. Um, uh, that's pretty amazing. I, I like yeah. that. Well, there, did you know, um, it, it, it occurs to me that one, one of my favorite songs, Remember Me, is actually not my favorite song from the movie. It's probably not even like close to my favorite song from the movie. <laughs> okay. But, um, but La, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce it. Yorona? Uh, Yorona. Yorona. Yes. Is the weeping woman. And it's mm -hmm. about a mother who, who, um, loses her children and um and is searching for them and is weeping over them and it's, so in a sense yeah. you're tying you're tying both those songs together it's kind of interesting which is sung by imelda who is coco's mother um it's right. sung by her at the end as she's trying to save hector as she's finally come mm -hmm. around to forgive him um and so that she's singing this song at that point is is so significant yeah that is that mm -hmm. that was a good one um I mean, I love uh, Un Poco Loco is just fun. That was, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's the I song. That's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got to say, um, actually, Proud Coruscant is my favorite. And uh, yeah. I had to do the, like, I own the, you know, the Blu-ray, obviously. And so the, about the third time I, I was crying so hard when Remember Me that I couldn't quite enjoy <laughs> Um, proud course on at the end so i started skipping when he sings remember me so i stopped crying so i could enjoy proud course on. <laughs> well in, in a way proud course on is the 
it's it's the summary of the movie in it. You know, um, Miguel wants his whole family to sing together, um, and so it, um, it's that uh, family should love and support each other no matter what, and that uh, you know you should be proud to be part of a of a, of a love, large loving family. Um, and you know, he says, uh, "I've got the the lyrics up here." Um, uh, let's see. Our our love for each other will live on forever in every beat of my proud corazon. Corazon means heart. Um, mm-hmm. Our love for each other, uh, yeah. So um, it's repeated several times. Um, and uh, there's uh, another line uh, in um, in Spanish. I'm not going to try to do it in Spanish because it, uh, I, I will uh, butcher the <laughs> accent. Uh, but it's um, oh my, you know, all oh my family listen to me. My people sing as a choir. He's calling them this family that had rejected music. Uh, uh, you know, um, for generations because of this slight uh, that they felt that, that music had come between them. Music actually, in, in, the, in the end, brings them together. To, to sing. One of the things I wanted to say, actually, I remember now about Coco and, the, and, and hearing Remember Me is at that point, she was almost fully gone. Mm-hmm. She was almost in, like, you know, uh, it's someone with dementia or with Alzheimer's or who just is not present at all. Um, and when, the, when she hears the music, she comes back even to the point where she's singing. And I remember seeing a couple of, uh, videos over the last few years of people who have gone into these, um, nursing homes where you have, uh, elderly folks, especially those with dementia or the, or, uh, degenerative, uh, diseases that, that, that take away their mental faculties and play for them the music of their youth, the music of, of their, of their, their best years. And they not only do they perk up, sometimes they start singing. Sometimes they start talking to you like like as if there are no symptoms anymore. Um, and there's mm-hmm. just something about music that that really touches us deep down. Like music is is fundamental to what it means to be human. Every every culture sings. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, well, and. and- Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to throw in a little like Spanish thing also. Um, So in Spanish, the 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 words "remember me" are "recuérdame," and the the word for "remember" "recorder" is it has "core" in it, C O R, which is again "corazón." It's the word for heart. So to remember somebody in Spanish is not just in your mind, but it's more so in your heart to have that person in your heart. And so mm-hmm. I, I think that's also beautiful. Like what you're saying about the music is that it 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 touches her heart. So even yeah. if her mind may be failing, her heart is still alive, you know? Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It, I was totally not going for the, for the, um, you know, I was going for the psych, like your brain. <laughs> you know, I was going to talk about memory and yeah. how it works. And it, that, yeah. So yeah. Angela's version is much more better than what I was about to say. Well, but they're both, they're both valid. I mean, that's the thing is, is it's yeah. the beauty of it is, is, uh, it's both, you know, that the, the heart and the mind and, 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 and those things work together in that. Um, th- there's a song called much needed advice. Where uh, uh, Ernesto de la Cruz talks about, I uh, I had to have faith in my dream. He says he's telling an interviewer, uh, "How did you How did you seize your moment?" The interviewer asks him. He says, "I've had I've had to have faith in my dream. No one was going to hand it to me. It was up to me to reach for that dream, grab it tight, and make it come true." How sinister is that? At the end of the movie, <laughs> was because yeah. it wasn't. I just worked hard to make it happen. I I killed the, my partner and stole his music. <laughs> I seized it from him. Uh, I mean that. I mean, wow. He's a real villain. He's yes. a real yeah. villain. Yes. I mean, it's almost like sixth sense level of switch. I mean, I have to admit, I kind of figured out like really early that Ernesto was not going to be his <laughs> great grandfather. I mean, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we we it would it wouldn't be that interesting of a movie if he was. And I kind of figured it was going to be Hector, but you know, yeah. whatever. Uh, it's still good. <laughs> it's still good when you figure it out. I figured them out all the time. Like I, I, people hate watching cop movies with me because i i'll point like <laughs> 10 minutes and i'm like that guy did it and you know how do you know that i don't know i just know it so anyway um so speaking of uh coco uh, i wanted to to kind of uh ask um well i'll probably uh, ask you and angela because this is you know your, your family the abuela has a special place in uh 
in in the heart of a, of a family, a Mexican family. Yeah. I mean, my my nana also had a special place in our Sicilian family. I mean, that's just, but it's mm. but it's a there's a particular way that an abuelo relates to the family, and in this, and in this movie, could you talk about that? Yes. A little? Oh, yes. Um, the abuelita, uh, the abuela is um, basically Mexican culture is matriarchal. So whatever grandma says, grandma gets. And I loved how um, Miguel's grandmother was portrayed, Elena, not Coco, but Elena yeah. was portrayed um, in this movie because the way that she spoke, the way that she acted, the way that she moved, um, her facial expressions, her dress, everything, even the way, you know, when she finds out that he has a guitar and she says, oh, I'm going to fix this by just smashing the guitar in front of everybody. That is so <laughs> relatable. <laughs> um, and, you know, people who don't come from the Mexican background may not have picked up on this, but when, um, you know, he's with, um, when Miguel's with a mariachi and grandma comes in and she sees him, she takes off her shoe and she starts hitting the mariachi with it. Right. Yeah. So in Mexican culture, that's called La Chancla. And um, La Chancla is like a flip flop. And so uh, it's almost like when like people say, oh, my dad took off his belt. You know, it's kind of like yep. that sort of thing for um, Mexican people. It's like, you know, a little bit violent. So keep it G rated <laughs> here. But um, yeah, so it was very satisfying for people of our background to see La Chancla being used like against somebody in the movie. It was very funny, especially because they're shoemakers also. For Sicilians, well, and she throws it at the dog too. Yes, and then she's like, "Get my shoe." <laughs> For Sicilians, it's uh, it's the uh, wooden spoon that she stirs the the uh, <laughs> sauce with, the, the gravy, the Sunday gravy. Um, so the, I had another question too. That the the, the, uh, well, the, the okay, I guess here alabrije, the guardian uh -huh, animals. Alabrije. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, they didn't really explain those those in the movie. I mean, they kind of just they're yeah. just kind of there. How do they relate to all of this? Is that is that is that a minor thing in, in in the culture, or is that as big as they made it? Well, okay, so alebrijes um, are um, fantastical creatures that are actually like art pieces. So um, there was a an artist in the 1930s, um, Pedro Linares Lopez, and he um, had this dream where he saw all these mythical creatures with like different body parts of different animals all made up together. And um, he was in a garden and um, the animals kept shouting this word, alebrije, alebrije. So he, as an artist, wanted to share that cool experience that he had with um people and so he started creating paper mache animals that had different body parts of different animals and all colorful and stuff um and then at the same time in oaxaca which is a village in in mexico there was um a wood carving a similar wood carving tradition of carving animals whether they were imaginary or real um and uh, it's just kind of like an, an artistic um, tradition in Mexico. So it's it doesn't have like a spiritual significance like it does in the movie. Um, but it was cool that I think that they kind of made it into part of the land of the dead because they are really beautiful, um, you know, fantastic creatures. And uh, it was just cool to see them on screen. Okay, cool. Thank you for explaining that because that's that's something I, I I suppose I could have Googled Ali Rahe and, and but. You know, it's nice to hear it uh, <laughs> like this. Did you, um, af after you watched this movie, because I did this, uh, uh, you're like, oh, I want a spirit animal like Dante, but I don't want Dante. <laughs> so um, what would be my alabrije? And I wanted a turtle. So I started Googling like alabrije turtles. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but you can actually buy Dante as an alabrije. Um, oh, Disney, cool. Of course. Cool. Yeah, that is cute. Cool. Yeah, for actually for Dante in particular, like I don't know if they have this like in the extras or anything. I don't have the DVD, but I'm sure that they probably talk about it where um the actual dog of that Dante is is modeled after is like the national dog of Mexico and um in the uh, Aztec tradition, there was a certain after life place called Migdal that if you went through that 
that land, you were guided by a dog. And so people would actually be buried with a cremated dog um, as like part of their burial ritual. So I think that's why they incorporated the dog into the the story you know obviously the hero's journey there's usually a guide of some sort um so yeah hector was a guide for sure but then also dante ends up kind of being a guide too we, we should well and it's not a disney movie without an animal sidekick <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we should point out for those who, who don't don't recognize like dante is uh is a reference to dante alighieri the italian writer who wrote the story dante's inferno where he an imaginary journey well it's actually the, the uh, divine comedy where he he travels through heaven hell and purgatory um you know he travels to the afterlife and so dante uh, and, and and yeah there's there's mm-hmm. also um in classical guitar yep there's um there's a a tie of tempo that's called Andante, Andante yes. Tempo. Uh, and so and, it's, and, it's also that too. <laughs> and, and there's a Disney a Disney reference here, which is, um, um, it's, uh, he named the, the dog, the conspiracy is he named the dog after um, Ernesto's horse, Dante. And, uh, you know, he's watching that video. Right. And, um, he's, yeah. He's riding a horse and he calls him Dante. So okay. it might be that too. But I like, I like the actual um, Dante Inferno Paradiso. Uh, reference i'd rather have that than oh yeah he just <laughs> named it after ernesto's horse Great. right well it, so. it, it could be both actually that they, they, they arranged it such that the horse is dante so they can name the dog dante because of that day like I, I i'll take it all i'll take it all <laughs> yeah. do you do you guys think that they named him miguel for a reason too because miguel um is michael in in english and that's like the archangel that fights the 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 oh. underworld powers of you know right. satan you know so i don't know maybe um his as his name was not supposed to be miguel originally they changed it um it was supposed to be like either pedro or um or marco it was supposed to be marco originally interesting oh wow and then they changed it to miguel yeah I wonder if that was why they wanted to make it that that more explicit connection to St. Michael. I don't know if that if that I don't know if that rings true for me, I guess, uh, that 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 Disney would or the it's how Mm -hmm. we say Disney. It's a giant. That's a giant company. I mean, really, Mm -hmm. Disney owns Pixar. Right. And yeah, but it's the handful of the movie makers (laughs) at Pixar who are making this movie, the director and the the screenwriter and that those folks, if they maybe they did have that, that that intent that they wanted to really make that connection to um to to St. Michael. I would I, I it would be nice if that were true because as, as the traditionally St. Michael the Archangel is an is an angel who leads the armies of heaven against Satan uh and his uh the demonic forces. And uh, so that would be nice that this Miguel who uh travels through the afterlife would be would have him as his patron saint. That would be that's a, a nice idea. I like that. Um so is there any other aspects of Coco uh, or of the, the the Mexican culture that it portrays that you guys want to bring up uh, that we've we haven't really touched on that m- you might have wanted to talk about because um, we've kind of talked about all the things that I had made notes of for myself. Um, do you want to do a part two? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much more to talk about. I mean, we, we still got time. I mean, it's not like we need to wrap it up quickly, but uh, um, but you know, we we could take a few minutes. I think if folks are enjoying it, uh, we we can go a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, did you guys? Uh, how familiar are you with the the person of Frida Kahlo? Because she kind of oh, plays yeah, a, of course. a funny uh, role in this little... movie. Yeah, yeah, I found that fascinating. If you look at that movie, they actually do incorporate uh, Mexican um, folk heroes into their into mm-hmm. this movie because uh, um, uh, Zapata, uh, the the guy who Mexican Revolution, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong. Um, mm-hmm. He's actually a cameo in there too. He's drinking with Ernesto in one scene. Right. So they they bring back these these um, uh, Mexican folk heroes in a sense, and I I love having Frida. Um, in this movie playing kind of a major role actually yes in a sense yeah, yeah. but uh, what, i mean what are your thoughts about having frida carlo because she's kind of a she she has if you watch the movie about her life she had um 
a very interesting life. So well, she, it's interesting. She was. She comes across as kooky in this. I mean, she's kind of get that weird yeah. art thing that she's doing, <laughs> where all of the Fridas come crawling out of the thing. I mean, it's, it's sort of <laughs> yeah. kind of mocks a little bit like modern art stuff. Uh, uh, and they and don't... It's, that that's hilarious because if you look at her art, a lot of it is self portraiture. Yes. So <laughs> like, and her face in everything. So that was really hilarious. And in case people don't realize, you know, she's a, she's the one who's very recognizable by the fact that her well she has a, a, a monobrow i mean she her, her eye she doesn't <laughs> shave her eyebrows and it's get it goes right across and that i mean it's a, it's her distinctive uh, facial feature you know if like if for me you know like it'd be the nose you know so the, oh he's that guy with the nose yeah for her it's the uh, the eyebrows um so uh <laughs> yeah so that was yeah that was the one i caught um i'm trying to think if there i, I didn't catch others because i, I wasn't too familiar uh, with them, but um, but maybe like you said, there was uh, Zapata was there. Um, I don't, yeah. I don't think I, find, I don't think I caught I, any, any others. Well, and the, you know, Pixar is always known for their Easter eggs. Whether their Easter eggs are paying homage to the folk heroes of the country they're representing, or they're paying homage to their heroes that are not part of that culture. Like, believe it or not, there is an homage to The Shining, the movie The Shining, in there. Oh, really? They have oh, wow. Like, yeah, it's a very brief. Um, like, uh, um, when, uh, it's in Frida's, um, workshop, when she's rehearsing you, they pan and you see the twins from the shining in there. Oh, right. Um, right. And, oh. Yeah. and so that's a, that's one of the things that one of the Pixar animators wanted to do is pay homage to the shining, but there's also little Pixar Easter eggs in there. They usually, um, have a little Easter egg for the next film. Um, coming out to kind of throw it a little um, advertisement and in this case it was Incredibles 2 and there's a little poster of Incredibles 2 on the, on the wall oh. like hand painted wow. and um, <laughs> and of course they had the um, Toy Story Pizza Planet truck Pizza Planet truck um, yeah that goes by <laughs> and the Rivieras or Rivera's sorry Rivera's shop was established in 1921 which is the same year that Walt Disney established his um, animation studio so there's cool. a, a shout out to disney here's where i get all disney geeky so um <laughs> and then uh, there's um uh, most pixar uh animators graduated from california institute of the arts and so there's always an homage to classroom a117 113 listed in, or 113 yeah yeah. Number. <laughs> yeah yeah numbers numbers um but it's yeah it's listed in on um all of Ernesto's album covers and as well as the number that they're in when they go to customs. So okay. the room wow. there's also a, yeah, uh, and there's a Nemo among ahead. the Alabrias, uh toys mm-hmm. that, uh, that uh, Miguel sees at the beginning on that table. Um, there's a Nemo on there uh, from Finding Nemo. Uh, there's also Woody and Buzz from uh, uh, Toy Story. They're uh, pinatas, right? Pinatas, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. But they're like they're that's ubiquitous to Mexico anyway. So it's <laughs> yes. kind of like uh, yeah. So they were like, well, it's part of their culture anyway. But it's it's kind of a nice homage. Um, there's also some speculate Sid from Toy Story. Um, the original Toy Story one yeah. is yeah is in there too, and he is one of the. Um, um, contestants. He's the DJ contestant for the music contest oh. in the underworld. And he's wearing the same t-shirt Sid is. Right. So they're like, that's Sid. And they're like, no, no, <laughs> it's not Sid. He just happens to like the same band. So, um, so there's a lot of other, I know somebody said there was a Wreck-It Ralph com- uh, but I haven't oh, found it yet. So when I find it, I'll, I'll see if I can find Wreck-It Ralph. In there. Of course, John Ooh. Ratzenberger is, is in it because he's in every Pixar movie. Um, yes. And in this one, he was, uh, let's see, a ghost called Juan Orthodontia, which is yep. uh, John, he, John he's Tooth. And, yeah. <laughs> yep. He's, and he's, his, his uh, picture was on his dentist, Alfredo. So <laughs> okay. That was his whole. Yeah, that was uh, funny. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, I, I, that's all the ones I, 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 I could find uh, for. Well, those pictures. are the major ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen anything else, but um, it's always fun to be like, oh, there's, you know, blah, 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 you know, or there's, a, you know, Woody or Buzz or, um, you know, The Incredibles or it's it's always fun. Disney always likes to do that and, and the fans always enjoy it. Well, it's one of the one of the things about Pixar movies in general. Oops, I just started. Uh, one of the things about, I was 
Googling Easter eggs and of course a YouTube video came up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that would have been bad. Um, but one of the things about Pixar is that they enjoy is that it's not just a kid. They're not just kids movies that adults can go and enjoy them and find something for that's on their level. And the, the, but that it's also not above the heads of the kids and that it's so it can be enjoyed on, on di- multiple levels. And even to the point where, you know, you can be the adult who's looking for Easter eggs and little hidden uh, messages and that sort of stuff in them. And, and that's one of the things I always appreciate about about these about these movies is I can enjoy it. My kids can enjoy it. And it's a family event. Um, and yes. that's the nice thing about this movie is that it's about family. Um, coming together in uh, both in this life and in the next, which is a, a really nice uh, aspect of that. So uh, yeah, and then they um, Disney at the end in the credits they do a, a friendo yes. um, yeah. in the credits, and they um, honor some of you know some famous people like Steve Jobs and Walt Disney and um, um, Rickle uh, Don Rickles. Oh, Don Rickles because yeah. he had just died, yeah. and those are you know, and and probably some other um, famous people whose Disney characters live on. Um, Don Rickles in that was Mister Potato Head in Toy Story, in case people don't know. Right, and, and Steve Jobs was one of the uh, was one of the founders of Pixar, in addition to Apple. Right. So yeah, it, it, that was kind of a nice touch too. Um, if you ever get to see the bonus material for Coco, it it actually made me cry just as much as the movie because they they really took it to heart because most of the people working on it were um, of Mexican American heritage or from Mexico and they they were like this is my my love letter to my family is w- me working on this film and it was just it was so touching so if you ever get to watch the bonus stuff yeah. you know I highly recommend it you know that's one of the things I really appreciate about appreciate about Pixar is and in addition to what the other things I said but is their efforts to to get deep into they're not just they don't just go on the surface so like hey this would be good to kind of harvest this culture for our movie <laughs> but they 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 get into it they respect it they want to do it justice whether it's whether it's french or polynesian or mexican or whatever it is they're doing and they they, they tried to i mean of course it's it it's never going to be satisfy everybody. Somebody who's always going to be unhappy with, with it. I mean, it's just the nature of, of, who, of people. Uh, so, but, but I really do appreciate how Pixar really tries to, to get it right uh, as much as they can within the bounds of having to make an entertaining and profitable movie, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. what, what they're called to do. Uh, so I do appreciate that. Well, maybe we do need to do a uh, secrets of Coco too, at some point, uh, Unless they make it Coco 2, in which we will. Uh, they probably yes. will. It's probably coming yes, out. It, yes, yeah. there always is. If, if they make money off, off of the first one, they'll, they'll if it's direct to video or what, but they'll, they'll be one. Um, but in that case, uh, I think maybe we should uh, kind of wrap it up here uh, and, and, and tell folks, hey, if you, if you want to continue the discussion, um, you know, go to uh, the uh, sqpn.com or to our Facebook page. Uh, find the link to this show that we're doing, Secrets of Coco, and put some comments in there. Tell us what you think. Tell us what we missed. Um, tell us you know what we got wrong. You know, um, I, I want to have a discussion. So we have a, a fruitful and um, uh, respectful discussion about things, and I, I'm, I'm I'm always open to that. So um, leave us some feedback there, or you can send us an email to secrets at sqpn dot com. Uh, so you can find uh, links to. Uh, to us on our show notes at sqpn.com and uh, I'll also put links to some of the things like the 22 rules of storytelling by Pixar and that sort of thing uh, that we that we mentioned and uh, but, and apart from that make sure you subscribe to the podcast feed so that you get all future installments of the secrets of movies and TV shows we get good stuff coming up uh, some very interesting movies and TV shows we're going to be talking about um, I could maybe mention we're going to do our second part in our Raiders retrospective. We're going to talk about uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom soon. So that's going to be fun. We already did the Raiders of Lost Ark. Um, we're going to do Temple of Doom, and, I, and I've committed to doing Last Crusade, but we're not doing Crystal Skull. <laughs> Just <saying. laughs> I mean, if if you enjoy hearing people get be very down on a movie, that maybe maybe we'll do it. But yeah, because it can be fun to hear people like ah. Um, but uh, we're going to do that, and then some TV shows that we we want to talk about. Colony, which just finished, it's a uh, third or fourth season we just did um this past week we did secrets of the expanse which is a great uh, both book series and tv show so please subscribe 
uh, to, 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 to listen to it. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, please go to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Not a four-star review, not a three-star review. Leave us a five-star review and tell us why you like it. Because, for, honestly, uh, you doing that helps us get the news out and uh, grows our audience, helps us to do more of this type of thing. And we really do appreciate that. Um, anyway, until next time, Deborah Shaben, thank you for sharing in the secrets of Coco. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always fun to talk about Disney. And definitely go, by the way, uh, go to sqpn.com slash uh, pilgrim and subscribe to Deborah's podcast that she does here called The Pilgrim Life, um, which is also a sort of hero's journey. So go check that yes. out. <laughs> uh, and then Angela Silana, thank you as well. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Gracias. And especially for sharing uh, your, your Mexican heritage with us. I, I really do appreciate that. And uh, once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. <laughs>